Welcome back to Economic Outlook. Today I want to discuss President Obama's recent announcement of more stringent automobile emissions and fuel economy standards. I want to explain why this is an important first step in lessening our country's dependence on fossil fuels. I also want to explore demographic and economic trends which will reduce the effectiveness of these measures if they aren't followed up with successful long-term planning. First, let's look at what the President announced, and then I'll show you the model I've built to explore fuel savings in the future. The President's plan calls for a one-third reduction in carbon dioxide emissions and an improved composite fuel economy of 35.5 miles per gallon by the year 2016. Additionally, the EPA will oversee both efficiency and economy standards. This is the first time that a national governing body has overseen cars sold throughout the United States. In the past, states have been allowed to set their own requirements, and this would cause considerable problems for automakers trying to sell the same car with different standards in different states. President Obama also cautioned that these new fuel efficiency measures would be expensive. It's expected to add about $1,300 to the price of a new car sold in 2016. However, the President correctly pointed out that consumers would save over $2,800 in fuel economy over the life of the vehicles. The President's plan is laudable for many reasons. It marks a departure from the Bush administration's policies and also demonstrates President Obama's commitment to what he calls a clean energy economy. Just a few years ago, this type of plan wouldn't have been feasible. However, the diminished state of automakers in this country have left them without the political clout to block these types of fuel economy measures. Additionally, the public is more receptive as well. SUVs are less popular, and people are more sensitive to mileage issues after last year's gasoline price spikes. I applaud the President's plan as a good first step in reducing our dependence upon fossil fuels for transportation. However, it's important to understand the practical implications of fuel economy in the real world. Fuel economy measures only postpone long-term gains in consumption of commodities like gasoline. To truly reduce demand for these commodities, we have to change driving habits, invest in infrastructure, and develop alternative means of transportation. I'm confident that President Obama and his team understand this, and will take the necessary steps to continue to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. To give some examples of how these standards will play out in the real world, I want to examine the city of Atlanta, its commuters, and what happens here when fuel economy standards are introduced. Atlanta is consistently ranked as one of the most congested cities in America. Suburbanites rely on a handful of highways to funnel them to their jobs inside the city. There's very little public transit to speak of. The city's bus and rail line, called MARTA, is underutilized, mismanaged, and in one budget crisis after another. The main rail line barely extends outside of Atlanta's city limits. Many would consider it a failure of planning that MARTA bus and rail lines do not extend into outlying suburbs. However, when the system was being built in the 1970s, residents of these counties famously voted against MARTA's expansion into their communities. People in Gwinnett County, Marietta, Alpharetta, and other suburbs famously voted against MARTA's expansion, claiming it would bring a pipeline of crime from the inner city into their suburban communities. This was really thinly veiled racism and an expression of a public aversion to mass transit. Although people's attitudes have changed, residents still oppose MARTA's expansion into counties north of Atlanta. Years of mismanagement and service interruptions have eroded public confidence in MARTA's reliability. As a result, Atlanta has one of the highest rates of single passenger vehicle commuters in the United States. I'll use Atlanta as an example of how fuel efficiency measures are only one step in a more lengthy process to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels for transportation. Let's examine the state of commuting in Atlanta today. According to the U.S. Census, the Atlanta Metropolitan Statistical Area has a population of over 5,100,000 people. Now, of these 5 million people, half of them are over the age of 16 and employed. The U.S. Census Community Survey gives details on these workers' daily commutes. 78% of Atlanta's workers drive a single passenger car, truck, or SUV to work. 10% carpool 
and only 3.3% use public transportation. In fact, as many people walk or use a bicycle, 3.3%, as use Atlanta's mass transit. Most of this development has occurred in outlying suburbs away from Atlanta's main downtown area. This has caused a great strain on the infrastructure in the area, as you might expect. Droughts are frequent, and most cities have to rely on water rationing in the summer months because of depleted lake levels. Additionally, most of these outlying communities rely on a series of smaller toll roads and highways to funnel commuters onto one of three major interstates into Atlanta's major downtown area. As you might expect, since these interstates were first built, passenger loads have greatly increased, and delays and traffic jams happen almost every day. Atlanta's particular situation shows the difficulty in conserving natural resources like oil. As long as energy is cheap and abundant, an almost insatiable demand will begin to erode the finite supply of the commodity. I've built a model of Atlanta's population in the future to help explain this point. Very few people will argue that more stringent fuel economy standards won't help individual commuters save more money and use less gasoline. However, the growth of Atlanta's population will quickly erode the gross energy savings these measures put in place. Understanding how this happens requires an examination of how Atlanta's population will continue to decline in future years. Since the mid-1990s, Atlanta's population has shown a compound annual growth rate of about 3%. This means that every year, Atlanta's population grows by 3% over the prior year's total. My model uses four possible scenarios to forecast this growth in the future. The first of these is a constant growth rate. Basically, this assumes Atlanta will grow at a constant rate of 3% each year through 2033. And you can see from the chart, the population more than doubles from 5.3 million to 10.9 million people. An accelerating growth rate assumes a 3% growth rate in 2009 and adds 0.01% to this total each year thereafter. So for example, the growth rate in 2011 would be 3.02%. This category represents a more rapidly growing population, which in turn represents a more rapidly increasing demand for gasoline. Now I want to note that the actual model I built allows you to adjust this figure, but in the examples I'm using 0.01% as the increment. A declining growth rate assumes that the population of Atlanta starts with 3% in the first year and reduces the rate of growth by 0.01% each year after that. This is similar to accelerating, only it's going in the opposite direction. You can see the difference this makes in Atlanta's population. Again, in 2009, the population begins with around 5.3 million, and in the accelerating scenario, the population in 2033 is 11.5 million. In the declining scenario, it's only 10.3 million. This might not seem like a huge difference right now, but when we look at the expected gasoline consumption, we'll see why this is so important. The final projection is plateau. And this projection assumes a growth rate of 3% for a fixed number of years, and then reduces the growth rate to another figure, in the example I'm using 2%, for every year thereafter. I think this is useful if you want to experiment with rapidly declining growth rates from our economic depression, or changes in Atlanta's real estate market. The long-term implications for each of the scenarios in the model are important. As this chart shows, Atlanta's population in 2033 could fall between 9.5 million people and over 11.5 million people. The rapid growth in population translates directly into more people commuting to work on Atlanta's roads. About 39% of Atlanta's total population commutes in single passenger vehicles. This means that the number of commuters in Atlanta will increase from about 2.1 million people today to between 3.7 and 4.2 million people in 2033. This is more than double the number of people on the roads today. This growth will add to the gross demand for gasoline. In our next entry, we'll take these population estimates and apply them in our model of gasoline consumption. We'll see some surprising results and uncover some ways we can further reduce our dependence on fossil fuels beyond simply fuel efficiency standards. Thank you, and I'll see you next time on Economic Outlook.